My YouTube friends and family, welcome back. Just Christina here. Today we're going to fill in a folder on my channel that's been sitting vacant since December. And I took these two videos down because I was a little apprehensive of the YouTube platform changes in December. But in light of current events, I think it's important to uh, revisit this document entitled The Secret Executive Orders That Can Make a President Dictator. Now I found this eight and a half page document in my mom's folder and there's no author and there's no date, but it talks about the Cold War as current events, so we know it's pretty old. Um, I'm going to set it up so you can follow along. You guys feel free to share it, download it, do whatever you want as far as learning the information. Now, I also have it on the board here behind me, so I want you to look specifically at Executive Agenda 11051. It talks about the economy and the plans for the economy in three parts. But pay particular attention to subpart six regarding telecommunications. Uh, we'll talk about that more. Now, 10997 talks about power as the uh, residential electrical grid. 998 is farms and food, and it talks about uh, the transportation of the food from the farms to the table. 10999 is civilian transportation, boats, cars, things like that. 11001 is health services. We're going to skip over 11002 and save it for the end. So 11003 talks about civil airports and the commandeering of personal aircraft. 11004 is housing and the relocation of citizens into appropriate or approved housing grids. 11005 talks about freight and the transportation of all goods. And like I said, we're saving 11002 for the end because it has subparts A through E. And it talks about emergency postmaster identification registry. So that's something that we're going to discuss also briefly. Uh, there's also a registry for executive orders. If you guys don't know what that is, um, we're going to talk about that also. But there's about 38,000 executive orders on the books, if you guys didn't know that. Um, and they've been around just as long as we've had presidents. So the most important and famous executive order is Proclamation 95. That's the Emancipation Proclamation. That was in 1863 by Abraham Lincoln. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt actually signed more presidential executive orders than any other president. And I mean, we can speculate that it's because he was trying to lead the nation out of the Great Depression, but he had things like the New Deal. So that's probably the second most important executive order. Um, so again, feel free to do whatever you want to do with this to share the information. Look up the executive orders that we're talking about specifically. And without further ado, let's go ahead and get it set up so we can review this document in two parts. The secret executive order that can make a president dictator. All right, let's go ahead and get started. The secret executive orders that can make a president dictator. You guys, we are reviewing this because I want you to think about current events that are happening as we read through this and pay close attention to just how true the statement history repeats itself is. In the event of a national emergency, which can range from an increase in international tensions to a collapse in the stock market, there's one collapse in the stock market, there are now in the books a number of laws that give the chief executive the legal authority to suspend all constitutional rights and mobilize every human, natural, and industrial resource in the U.S. Nothing has been overlooked in preparing the emergency plans. Executive Order 10995 tells how all communications, newspaper, radio, and television will come under government control. All right, well, we already know that they parrot the same narrative on every channel um, because it's what we are being force-fed and what we are being told. And you really have to think outside the box and get a bigger news collective and a bigger picture from outside resources and kind of draw your own conclusions. Um, 10997 deals with electric power, petroleum and gas, solid fuels and minerals. 10998, food farms, farm equipment, fertilizer and food production and distribution facilities. 10999, transportation, including ships, railroads, highways, and all civilian facilities, etc., etc. And every one of these programs can be implemented in a few hours. It was precisely 2.34 p.m. when the news service learned that the president had called an emergency meeting in the White House. 
The president, his cabinet, and advisors were conferring with the Joint Chiefs of Staff, directors of the Central Intelligence Agency, and the National Security Council. Powerful congressional leaders had also been summoned to the meeting. At the White House, the president told of increasing domestic and international problems. Anti-war college and civil rights groups were demonstrating in hundreds of cities. Riots flared in Chicago, San Francisco, and Memphis. The stock market was at the lowest point in 23 years. Well, again, history is repeating itself, right? Unemployment was a growing menace to the nation's welfare. This morning, the Central Intelligence Agency verified that the Red Chinese have developed their missile delivery system, said the president. This news may demoralize the stock market. Gentlemen, we are facing the prospect of a major economic depression. The president nodded to an aide. The White House assistant adjusted the frames of his glasses and stood up. We are faced with future international tensions and an uncertain stock market, he explained. Our gold reserves are at a critical level. The CIA knows of two plots by European speculators to start a run on our gold reserves. This would lead to the devaluation of the dollar if they are successful. The presidential aide spoke for 53 minutes, reporting on domestic and international problems, and concluded with, the executive orders empower the president to declare a state of national emergency and implement the plans in existence for these problems. An audible gasp of disbelief rose from the officials around the table. The senator from Illinois overturned his chair as he jumped to his feet. Mr. President, there is no precedent for this action, he shouted. This could mean the end of democracy in America. This nation has overcome great dangers in the past without a dictatorship. Unusual times require unusual measures, said a general. We must remain strong to defeat communism. Here, here, said a cabinet member. A senator from the far west turned to the attorney general. The Senate will have something to say about the legality of this, he muttered. We're not about to tear up the Constitution. The executive orders have been the law of the land for several years, explained the attorney general. They are as legal as the Constitution. We have checked this with both the Supreme Court and world courts. I'm going to ask for a show of hands for declaring a national emergency, the president said. He looked down the table at the nation's most powerful officials. The assistance given during this crisis will be remembered long and well. Gentlemen, those in favor of implementing the executive orders, please raise their hands. While this may sound like the scene from some novel of the future, there are laws now on the books allowing the president to legally become a dictator over the U.S. The first of these laws was passed in 1962, and additional measures have been passed since then. To understand this bizarre and dangerous situation, we must turn to the Federal Register. And you guys, this is that register that I told you about, okay? Um, I encourage you to go look it up on your own. It is one of the most powerful and most obscure publications in the world. The register prints the official proclamations, directives, and orders created by the president and the executive sector of our government. Through tradition and usage, no congressional or judicial review is required on executive orders. They become law immediately upon publication in the federal register. Our presidents have been empowered to create laws, and they frequently do. The first of the executive orders under discussion was signed into law by President John Kennedy, and they are legal little-known dangers to our constitutional rights. Spokesmen for the government dismiss the possibility that these executive orders might be misused. There's absolutely no danger to constitutional liberties, declared a government official. These executive orders would be implemented only after the approval of the House and Senate. That approval would only be asked if a nuclear war seemed imminent. Despite these assurances, executive orders are seldom sent to Congress for approval. In 1952, President Harry Truman issued an executive order to seize the steel mills. His actions stopped threatened strikes by steel workers during a critical period in the Korean War. President Dwight Eisenhower issued an executive order which directed and authorized the Secretary of Defense to use such of the armed forces as necessary to enforce school integration in Little Rock, Arkansas. Neither of these orders was sent to Congress. Following the assassination of Sen Senator Robert Kennedy in 1968, President Lyndon Johnson was concerned about the safety of Senator Ted Kennedy. Johnson ordered the Secret Service to provide protection for the Massachusetts senator. There is no precedent for such protection, an aide said. We can't legally do it. 
I want Teddy protected, President Johnson snapped. If necessary, I'll put out an executive order. The Secret Service quickly supplied guards for Senator Kennedy. Although President Johnson did not create an executive order, this illustrates the chief executive's knowledge of use of such directives. The executive orders under discussion were launched in February of 1962 when Director of the Budget David Bell advised President Kennedy this need for executive orders is underscored by the fact that emergency planning is needed with respect to um, limited war situations, including concern for various matters as economic stability, manpower, and other major programs supporting military action. A glance at the first of these executive orders reveals a broad definition of what might be considered a national emergency. Executive order number 11051. Whereas national preparedness must be achieved and maintained to support varying stages of mobilization as may be required to deal with increases in international tension with limited war or with general war, including an attack upon the United States, and whereas the national security and our continuing economic and prosperity are interdependent, Appropriate attention must be directed to effective coordination of emergency preparedness measures with national economic policies and objectives, and an increase in international tensions could be defined as anything from another Berlin blockade to a future Cuban-style missile crisis. The present Vietnamese war is certainly a limited war by any definition. The second paragraph, paragraph is equally disturbing as it links national security to the nation's economy. These orders might be put into effect after a serious drop in the stock market, devaluation of the dollar, a run on our gold reserves, a recession, or a depression. Even a run on the banks would provide a valid loophole for a power-hungry president to become a dictator. You must remember the intent of these executive orders, the government spokesman explained. We are faced with the ever-present danger of atomic war. The executive sector could assume these dictatorial powers only after Congress declares a national emergency. As we have seen, the executive orders are not phrased in that manner. In addition, a legal national emergency now exists. The state of national emergency proclaimed by Congress to meet the Korean War has never been rescinded. People of goodwill might feel these executive orders were hurriedly written by a tired, weary chief executive. You can't expect a president to watch every word, a government official stated. In reality, the Office of Legal Counsel in the U.S. Department of Justice carefully checks each executive order. An assistant attorney general and his staff review and, if necessary, revise the order to retain the intent and legality of the measure. The wording of an executive order is weighted carefully by the government's best legal minds. Executive Order Number 11051 also created the Office of Emergency Planning, OEP, and instructed the President's Cabinet members to create plans to take control of their specific sectors of society. So uh, the Office of Emergency Planning, you guys know what that is now, right? It's FEMA, Federal Emergency Management. Uh, the order continues, whereas mobilization, readiness, and civil defense activities can be accomplished most effectively and efficiently through the performance by departments and agencies of the government of those emergency preparedness functions related to their established roles and capabilities. So he's basically saying we should compartmentalize it. Whereas responsibility for emergency preparedness involves virtually every agency of the federal government, and there is a need to provide a central point of leadership, and now, therefore, by virtue of the authority vested in me as the President of the United States, it is hereby ordered as follows. Section 101, Resume of Responsibilities. The Director of the Office of Emergency Planning, here and after referred to as the Director, shall A, advise and assist the President in the coordination and in the determination of policy for the emergency departments and agencies, here and after referred to as federal agencies, designed to make possible at federal, state, and local levels mobilization of the human, natural, and industrial resources of the nation to meet all conditions of national emergency, including attack on the United States. All right, now we're gonna to skip to part three, okay? Um, part three, section 301. Special Emergency Planning Responsibilities, 
Section 301 General. Under the direction of the President, the Director shall have primary responsibility, one, for planning the assumptions and broad non-military emergency preparedness objectives, two, for planning the non-military organization and functioning of the federal government in time of national emergency, three, for planning for that emergency mobilization of telecommunications resources. The OEP has become a little known but potentially very powerful extension of the executive director. Many of the functions of the OEP are similar to those of civil defense. However, the OEP reports directly to the president while the Office of Civil Defense is part of the Department of Defense. This may be changed in the future as the Nixon administration is considering combining these two agencies, a Washington source revealed. Uh, the potential power of the executive orders and civil defense would be placed in the Office of Emergency Planning. So again, you guys, this is dated and this is talking about the upcoming Nixon presidency and we all know how that went. Um, okay, so officials of both OEP and CD seldomly, seldom discuss their plans for future emergencies. These plans are stamped top secret, although they affect any citizen. Saga has discovered that there are plans in existence that would place dictatorial controls over every segment of American society. Regardless of the reason for a national emergency, putting these executive orders into effect will for all practical purposes end democracy in America. As an example, Executive Order 10995 created the post of Director of Telecommunications Management and declared telecommunications was vital to the security and welfare of the nation and to the conduct of foreign affairs. It reads, whereas it is essential that responsibility be clearly assigned within the executive branch of the government for promoting and encouraging effective and e efficient administration and development of the United States national and international telecommunications and for affecting the prudent use of the radio frequency spectrum by the executive branch of our government. Okay, let's stop right there for a second because we're only gonna go through another couple of paragraphs, but I wanna talk about this. This is something that they implemented in the late 60s. Okay, there is a reason that they gave everybody digital converter boxes and freed up the airspace. There is also a reason that 5G was heavily funded by the federal government and world governments. So this is not just something that they wanted to give you for free because they're your buddy, they're your pal. This is something that helps them exponentially in the long run. And a strong telecommunication and a strong communication system to the government is vital to implement their ongoing agenda. All right, whereas there is an immediate and urgent need for integrated short and long range planning with respect to national and international telecommunications programs, for continuing supervision over the use of radio frequency spectrum by the executive branch of the government and for the development of national policies in the field of telecommunications. Now, therefore, as President of the United States and Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces of the United States, it is hereby ordered as follows. Section 1, there is hereby established the position of Director of Telecommunications Management, which shall be held by one of the Assistant Directors of the Office of Emergency Planning. So they are one and the same. Uh, section 3, the authority to assign radio frequencies to government agencies, including all functions heretofore vested in the Interdepartment Radio Advisory Committee, is hereby delegated to the Director of the Office of Emergency Planning. Such authority shall include the power to amend, modify, or revoke frequency assignments. Section 6. In carrying out functions under this order, the Director of Telecommunications Management shall consider the following objectives. The objectives include plans, policies, and programs to satisfactorily serve the national security, sustain and contribute to the full development of world trade and to the full development of world trade and commerce, strengthen the position and serve the best interests of the United States in world trade and commerce, and serve the national interest in negotiations with foreign nations. Okay, we're going to stop right there. And we are right here. So we have about four pages left, but you guys let that sink in. The government does not have 
everybody's right and freedom to communicate at best interest. They will take your ham license away in a heartbeat if you do something wrong. And a lot of you guys out there that have paid big money for your setups, you know what an investment of time and money that it is. All right, let's take a brief intermission and we'll get into part two.